This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Fix It 101, the home improvement show to help you do it yourself. I'm Jason Klein here with Pam Pibus, ASHI Certified Inspector at Inspect It Like a Girl, and Licensed Contractor Jeff Sammons from Houseworks. You can join the conversation this morning and tell us what you're working on for 2021 at 877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. Or send an email to fixit101 at mpbonline.org. How are you guys doing this morning? Well, first off, I need to say something about that hat job I had on. I know this is radio. Right. You folks can't see this, but he and I have on the identical hat today. <laughs> you know what? And it looks uh, appropriate for both people, as strange as that may be. I was going to say something about that, Pam. We are twinning with our hats. That's true. But with probably later on this afternoon, we won't need it. <laughs> no. And that's well, I don't. Yeah. It, that's well, part of it's the show today. Dude. <laughs> right. That's part of the show today, the weird weather. Because it's snowing one day and (laughs) sunny the next. So, um, but anyway, Jeff, you with us this morning? I'm with you, hundred percent. I like the hats too. (laughs) I didn't look. I did. I didn't get the memo. Right. Well, so so what have you guys been working on? I know you have. Have you actually gotten back to work yet, Uh, uh, Pam? Have you started working again? Or did oh, you gosh, ever yeah. stop? We never stopped. Oh, okay. <laughs> we just, we never stopped. We just kept going. So normally I can get in my winter projects, but it's been a little difficult because of the uh, work keeps getting in the way. <laughs> Dumb work. <laughs> yeah, it's so overrated. Right. Uh, hey, but I got a question for Jeff because um, for the contractor. <laughs> I thought, who could I ask? And I was like, oh my gosh, I do a radio show with a contractor. Right. I'll just you got ask a guy. <laughs> yeah, you got a guy. I got, I got a guy. Right. So one of the projects that if it ever stops raining, I'm going to take care of is I have a raised uh, bed outside. It's not near my foundation and it's slanted and it goes toward a retaining wall that was built by, I had a contractor do it a couple of years ago and I never did anything with the dirt behind it, never, it just, anyway, it's just been sitting there. So now it's time to come in, and I don't want to add dirt behind it until I put a drain in there. So I was at one of the big box stores yesterday, Jeff, and I saw this product called Easy Drain. Are you familiar with that? Easy Drain. Jeff, you heard that? You, you know you know what, what, Pam, I've heard of them. I am not familiar with them, but you are exactly right get a drain in there um do not do not trap that water in there so oh yeah it'll rot that wall and and this is the cool look this up online folks this was the coolest thing it's called easy drain uh-huh. and i watched a youtube video on it but you don't have to buy all the gravel and the cloth. It's all encompassed. Are you talking in about this? this the, the big thing yeah. that you see that is, it looks like a giant snake thing. Um, and it, it already has like the kind of like this hosiery over styrofoam over the pipe. Yeah, it kind of looks like a snake with a coat on. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> I, I've seen that before, and I thought, man, that's cool. So you just, like, bury that thing, and we're on our way. And you're on your way. You have to, you know, obviously set your angles right, but it comes with the couplings. comes uh-huh. in 10-foot lengths, and then you can couple it. And I've got a 30-foot wall next to my driveway, uh-huh. and I'm going to put in a raised bed there and probably do some flowers and vegetables because it gets some pretty good sun. But I just waited because I didn't want to do it, my dirt prep, until I got my drainage taken care of. And so I was dreading having to buy all those rocks. And Right, right. <laughs> you That's know? really so cool. So I waited. But I saw this. It's a one-man job. I could do it. Oh, one girl. Right. I mean, right. One, yeah, one lady. One lady job. <laughs> one female. Right. One female job. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Jeff, what are you so, working on? 
Well, again, you know that it, it, it sounds like Groundhog Day for me, <laughs> but uh, we are desperately trying to get another home ready to close. Okay, I thought and, you were going to uh, say you had to go get your boat for some reason. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I didn't hear about the, that storm. <laughs> the boat, the boat saga is going to take a whole show by itself. Okay. Um, we. We're not successful in finding a boat yet. Uh, I'm going to take a little trip next weekend and look at some more of them. So. Hard life, man. It's yeah. rough. Yeah. yeah. Somebody's got to do it. Right, yeah. Well, I took, uh, believe it or not, I took a, a week off, guys, and I decided my wife had been asking me forever to redo the kitchen. So this is what I did. It was it was oh, a, boy. it was a redo. <laughs> now now wh- I didn't move any plumbing, right? But I had mentioned on the show weeks ago that I had installed um, under cabinet lighting, right, with a dimmer switch and all that other jazz. Well, I did that knowing that I was going to be doing this. So what we what I did, I took the week off and and um, put in a new backsplash. And painted all the cabinets. Now the cabinets, the 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 kitchen cabinets were they were custom. They were nice cabinets, but they were wood. They were original wood, uh, very nice looking. Still had the the shine on them and everything. Of course, that in itself is an issue. Um, but I took the week off and literally spent two days sanding and more time painting and and. Putting in a cutting board for backsplash and the whole nine yards. Java and I were discussing this project in the show or before the show came on. And, you know, it turned this, you know, my kitchen was nice, but it was darker kitchen with the tile background and everything else. But so we, we completely fit it, flipped it around to more of a farmhouse look and brightened it up really, really big time. But I can tell you, um, as Java and I talked about, if you have the tools already, and that's a big if. If you have the tools already, this was a two hundred and fifty dollar job for me to to completely redo the cabinets and 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 put in a brand new backsplash. But if you what did you the, do? Well, all I did was I used. Uh, there is a um, a a board a a board type product like a bead board type product that looks like shiplap. So and so and it comes by eight by four uh, uh, sheets of it. So you can cut it to fit whatever you need it to cut. Well, anyway, that's what we wanted to go with something quick and simple. So I simply glued that to uh, the the backsplash, not not the previous one, but but you know I, I glued that on there and, uh, and cut it to the cabinets. Then I had to pull all the cabinet doors off. Now, having done this before, I knew not to just yank all of the uh, hinges off of there and throw them in a bucket. You know, you got to number these things and know exactly where they came from and exactly how they came on and off. And so I took tons of pictures, but I spent a couple of days sanding those cabinets down. Then I spent a day caulking and and a couple of days painting. I told Java, I said, you know, this is not something I wish I could have done it faster, but Literally, there are times when you're just sitting there waiting for paint to dry. There's, I mean, there's nothing else you can do, but just <laughs> sitting right. right for the next coat. Okay, well, let's watch TV, I guess. You know. Yeah, don't get in a hurry. No, and, and there was you know? no – I can tell you this. There is no way – I told Java, there is no way, in my opinion, if you're going to do it right, that you can take off – Buy your supplies on a Friday night and be cleaning up on Sunday evening. It's not It's not going to happen. Not going to work right. Like that, you know. You know another thing too, uh, Jason. I'm glad you. I'm glad you told that story. For a small amount of money, uh, you can go in your kitchen and and replace all of your cabinet doors and drawers, mm-hmm. uh, uh, doors and drawer box fronts, um, for relatively a, a low budget, right. and end up end up at the end of the day with a remodeled kitchen, take it one step further if it's in the budget and replace your appliances. Right. And, you know, bam, I, I've got a brand new kitchen and I have not, 
I didn't break the bank. Yeah, well, and I didn't, you know, you don't have to break the wall either. You know, you you yeah. can you know you can do some things without actually tearing the kitchen up and still really make a difference. This thing sure. completely brightened up our home. To be honest with you, I mean, it just completely made oh, a, a total it, yeah. difference uh, between a kind of a darker. You know, like I said, it was pretty, but it was a much darker presence, and it just brightened up the place. So, but it was a great project. It didn't cost arm and leg, but it's a ton of labor. I'll give you that. It is a ton of labor, and it does require some tools. You know, sanders and, and, and even sandpaper, you know, paint. Buy some decent paint. I literally bought cabinet paint, enamel, you know, stuff that, you know, is 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 going to be tough that's going to last for a long time. So you spent some good money on actual paint. But Well, let me uh, let the inspector throw something out here, too, something I've seen. Just make sure when you're doing a DIY project. That you keep in mind on a kitchen, mm-hmm. I've seen some backsplashes that have been put behind ranges and stoves right. that is flammable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <and> it's, <laughs> that's, that's funny you say that because we went with that shiplap look. But behind the stove, the range, uh, we've got a, a kind of a metal plate behind there. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not going to put careful. like a shiplap behind there. Yeah, I don't put a shiplap there or paint back there. Another thing that I'll see people do, mm-hmm. and Jeff mentioned getting new appliances, if you're going to put a microwave over your range, whether it's gas or electric, right? check the manufacturer specifications on that. I think the minimum is 18 inches. And I've seen them down as close as, as um, 12 inches. Well, the heat from that range... Regardless if it's electric or gas, okay. So what you're talking about microwave. is the distance between the top of the range and the bottom of the microwave. You're saying needs to be 18 inches. Right. If you're going to put a like if you're vent hood, if you're going to come in and add a microwave, right. Instead of a vent hood, which right. I did that at one time, and I'm going to tell you, I did it wrong. <laughs> it was too low, oh, and it really? melted the bottom part of that. <laughs> That microwave. And so, you know, you just have to be really careful. Just check your manufacturer specifications when you buy stuff. Just look and see if there's a height distance or, you know. Okay. Don't burn it down right after you get it fixed. Right, right. So anyway, if you've got a project that you want to work on, number to call is 877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. Time for us to take our first break for the hour. If uh, today you're helping to plan out your year of fixes and home improvements, what have you got going on? We can help you out. Also, I have some uh, interesting numbers on fixing up the White House. What it ta- How many gallons of paint does it take to cover the white house the exterior how many gallons we'll guess it you know i'll give you the answer to that when we get back this is mpb think radio this podcast is a local production of mississippi public broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you if you can please donate today at mpbonline.org and thanks You're listening to Fix It 101 on MPB Think Radio. I'm Jason Klein here with Pam Pibus, ASHE Certified Inspector at Inspect It Like a Girl, and Licensed Contractor Jeff Sammons from Houseworks. Okay, before we uh, went to break, I mentioned how many gallons of paint would you say it would take to paint uh, the White House, the exterior of the White House? How many gallons of white paint? Uh, Pam or Jeff, what would you say? What's your number? Mm, I'm going to go with, um, gosh, I've been to the White House, too. It's big. Um, gosh, I, 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 I like 200 gallons. Okay. Pam? I was going to say 2,000. <laughs> nice. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm not putting the paint on that thing. One, <laughs> one way I can say that, one way or the other, somebody's really wrong here. But okay, uh, <laughs> no. that's why you don't want me. All right, here we go. Any work going on at your house? <laughs> right. It takes five hundred and seventy gallons of white paint wow. to cover the exterior wow. of the White House. Five hundred and seventy wow. gallons. But you know, Pam, a, a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned you always buy many more times uh, supplies than you need 
when you go to shop. So maybe you would buy the 2,000 gallons just to make sure. So, yeah, and it depends on the type of paint, too. If you got cheap paint, it may take 2,000 gallons. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, Good now, wait. I thought we were just painting, like, the front of it. Right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now it's got conditions. Sure. Okay. Now, oh, get this. Uh, if you've never known this, the inside of the White House, get this, has 132 rooms, 35 wow. bathrooms on six levels, as well as, all right, Jeff, oh, oh my gosh, 412 doors to go oh, off goodness. center, 412 doors, 147 windows, 28 fireplaces, eight staircases, and three elevators. So there you wow. go. 35 bathrooms. Well, they got like six plumbers just for the White House, you know? Exactly. <laughs> And they live in one of the 132 rooms, I'm sure. Anyway, all right, so um, number call is 877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. Got to mention here, uh, got an email in that I'm going to, okay. On your show that aired January 6th, you read an email from a person who had a light that would flicker. I have found many times that the inside center contact on the light socket will get pushed down and not spring up after a bulb is removed. When a new bulb is inserted, it will not make a good contact with the socket center contact. The fix is to turn the power off, insert a flat blade screwdriver into the socket, and pull the center contact up so a good contact can be made with the light bulb. That's from Michael in Memphis. I, I will say this is one of the things we first talked about on the on the show. If uh, back in the day in incandescent lighting, if you were finding out that you were going through a lot of incandescent bulbs one after the other, one of the very common things was the you know if you look inside the socket of a light bulb or the light bulb socket. Uh, there's a little tab in there, a little metal tab. Well, after a lot of wear, and if you plug the light bulb in too tight, if you screwed it in too tight, it would it would eventually, over time, bend that piece up so that it was always touching. Well, what it meant was it was just frying that light bulb, and they would go out a whole lot. So, so you could take that little uh, prong inside the socket and bend it out, and it would fix it. Oh, look, a kitty. Um, so <laughs> sorry, sorry. We, we do these shows via Skype and, uh, Kenny just joined. So that's okay. It's the modern world right there. But yeah, anyway, he wants to be on the show. So that's a great idea. Number to call is 877 MPB ring. That's 877-672-7464. Okay. I've got one that's coming right up the alley here of our home inspector and Jeff I know you're going to cringe when I mention this also but here we go Dear Fix It 101 crew I'm a big fan of the show I love to listen to you all especially when I'm traveling out of state gives me a taste of home I have a question for you all recently purchased a house built in the 1950s and only noticed afterward that all of the outlets are two prong outlets Okay. on further investigation it doesn't seem like they're grounded either well no they're not grounded. If they're too they're not out. grounded. <laughs> yeah. The whole electrical system is pretty old. I like to, I'd like to replace them all with GFI outlets so I don't have to pay to get the outlets grounded. Is this safe slash easy to do? Is there anything I should know before attempting this? Zach and Jackson. Yeah, Zach. Uh, first of all, you're going to waste a ton of money buying GFI outlets to put into something that it's not going to make it grounded anyway. So, okay, <laughs> I'm going to leave this to the pros, and uh, uh, Jeff and or Pam, go for it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like with you, Jason. It, it's really kind of a waste of money. The two wires are fine. I mean, what I did in my house, which was built in 58, I wanted to have grounding to my, um, um, my high-end, like my TV and my computers. And right. so I had what's called a home run put in from my meter box to the areas where I wanted it so that I would have them three-prong and ground. 
What you got to understand about grounding, the only purpose of grounding is to take lightning to the ground if your house gets struck by lightning. So in my experience in dealing with lightning is that it's really going to go wherever it wants to anyway. Yeah. So I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of money to try to GFI. The only places you need GFI are outside or in your bathrooms close to, or close to water. Right. Um, and those are just, you know, it's just a, a way to for, for there to be safety. But a house that was built in the, when was the last time, let's see, when did we start adding grounds, Jeff? In, um, in the 80s, maybe? I, you know, probably, I would think before then, but, you know, just grounding alone, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick little story about, about something that happened with, with, with lightning. We um, lightning struck the clubhouse out at out at Lake Caroline. It hit the chimney, blew the chimney like it had a bomb in it. Lightning caught a wire, ran across. This thing looked like a cartoon. Ran across the tile floor to the floor plugs in the floor, just popping up tiles like a cartoon. Wow! So. Yeah, so grounding alone is not is not going to protect you against um, lightning per se without a dedicated uh, lightning rod mounted to the highest point of the structure and then ground that lightning rod with a – how deep is a uh, ground rod? Is it six feet? Um, I thought it was eight, but I, I'm it, not. It very well or could, the pole is eight. It, okay, yeah. eight feet, and then those, we are recommending two of those eight feet apart, and those two be connected together, I think, is the is the way we're doing it now. Yeah, it's kind of like a step potential, but to the, to the email specifically, if I were going to spend money, and this is what I did, okay, yeah. this is my personal experience on a house that was built in 58, I had my electric panel updated. Um, because that's where the circuit originates. And I wanted to make sure it was from 1958. <laughs> so I updated it. Now, when you say you did money that, to do that, there you go. Paid no, your money. Did, what hired, kind of money are we talking about on, on grounding out a house? Well, the problem is, is that if you're going to ground out the house, you're going to have to run wires to all your outlets. Um, outlets. And I just think that's cost prohibitive. I didn't do it in my house. Right. I just ran, when I updated my bathrooms, and I did them at different times, I ran what's called a home run from the panel to the bathroom. Now, those outlets are grounded, and I can add my GFI there. But in my kitchen, I don't have grounded outlets because I've never gone into the walls in my kitchen. That'll happen. But right now, I don't have GFI protection next to my sink in my bathroom. I mean, in my kitchen, but I've got it in my bathroom. Well, don't tell so your inspector. So as long as I don't. I, well, you know, and I tell my clients all the time, unless you're going to wash your hands and stick your hand in the socket at the same time, you should be fine. Right. And don't <laughs> drop your blender in the running water right. you know, whenever it's running. If you're just safe, you know. It, it, it. Right. But, you yeah. know, some people get all up in arms about this GFI stuff, and it's really not that big of a deal. Right. Until it well, is. Well, I think... I th I think, Pam, it, it, it boils down to uh, education. I, I really do. All right. Um, well, uh, I – that's uh, – okay, well, we've answered his question for the most part. But I will say his his idea of buying a GFI for each outlet and hoping for the best there. Uh, Don't just, do it. So, well, <laughs> well, to tell you this, as a regular consumer, you can't buy a GFI for less than $15 as a regular consumer. So you're going to spend you a can lot get a of case money. Of them. You're going to spend a lot of <laughs> yeah. money. And really, even new code, I mean, the 2019 new ICC codes, you only have to have GFI protection outside and then anywhere within six feet of a water source. So right. bathrooms and kitchen. So you don't need it in your den. All right. right. You know what? Let's go ahead and talk to John in Mobile. He's got a, a question about grounding. You with us, John? Yes, sir. Hope everybody's had their coffee this morning. Well, because sort of, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what can we like help you with? 
I don't like to take advice from people that are not fully deca- uh, caffeinated. Caffeinated. Right. caffeinated. <laughs> His, I have a, a question about grinding again. I, too, have a house that's in the 60s vintage. Uh, my computer guru tells me that um, for the outlet that serves the computers, I think it has a uh, un- uninterruptible power supply, that I need a ground there. Well, needless to say, this has two-prong in that particular room. So being an engineer trying to figure out the easy way to do it, what I did, and I, I wanted to get your opinion as to whether this is a valid idea, is I took a separate ground, ran it to that one outlet, snaked it around until I got outside the house, put myself down a, a eight-foot copper rod, and attached it to a little bus bar that says, you know, if I need extra grounds, that's the way to go. Will that work, or do I have to run that ground all the way back to the power box? So, uh, Pam? Yeah, I, that's a, that's exactly what I did in my office before I ran the home run. Uh-huh. I, I did the identical thing, and it, it would have been like, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. Right. But I did it because uh, for my electronics um, in my what was my den? Now my den is my office. Work and for once, you? Yeah. But so, yeah, I, unless an electrician corrects me on that, that's exactly what I did. I think that would work. Okay. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Great, John. I, I, I can ignore the smoke that uh, I smell occasionally when I plug this thing in. Woo! <laughs> 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 Never mind. <laughs> that's, that's, a spark, that's a spark jockey joke. Make sure. Yeah. Uh, so make sure your, your 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 insurance premiums are paid up. Right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for being. Thank you. Uh, it always makes uh, me think, of, Jeff. You know, <laughs> it's funny to me. I, I grew up in one of these homes uh-huh. uh, that was paneling from one end to the other. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it was late sixties, early seventies. So sure. everything was panel, and I think. So you coated your wall with this cheap wood. What what is the I mean what is the percentage of fires that caught when wood paneling walls were were the big thing? Yeah, you know, I've never thought about that, but boy, a, uh, a house just had to go up in a big poof. Well, well, when the walls you know, are wood. I don't I don't think that was our issue. Uh, because obviously we have wood studs. We've still been right. using wood studs. I, I think what caused many, many fires back then was the aluminum wiring. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, obviously it would get loose, and then every time you turn a light on or plug something in the receptacle, you you, you get that arc right. eventually. Um, I think that's what caused more fires yeah. um, well, than... I, the, than, than I think no, the biggest uh, starter of fires in 1974 was the ashtray falling off the bed, probably. But. <laughs> well, you're probably right. right. And, um, you know, today, really and truly today, with all the safety measures we have and the smoke detectors and everything we have to, to keep this house from catching on fire, uh-huh. you know what's starting most of the fires now? It, and this is my opinion. Uh, it, it is, it is dry vents. Uh, no, well that too, but it is cooking. cooking. We, we, we burn more houses down cooking. Um, really? And it, yeah, it's just I always amazing. assume it's the fireplace or, you know, a candle you know, burning somewhere. You don't really see too many in fireplaces anymore. Right. I cannot tell you. The last time we put a wood burning fireplace inside a house. Wow! Now we still still do a lot of them outside. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But most most everything that we're doing inside now is is ventless gas logs. Right. Okay. Uh, well, well, let's well, talk about Jeff. I want to ask you. A well, question hang on, hang on, about now. Pam. Pam, hang on yeah. just a second. Uh, this poor guy, Sydney in Jasper County, has been waiting on us for, for a oh. while here. Let's go talk to him real quick. Sydney in, in Jasper County. What's going on, Sydney? Uh, man, I give a gold nickel to have that woman that y'all got fixed like a girl. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate you more than 
than we do in this election. <laughs> it takes you and see well, what you need you, to do. Uh, I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna cut through the chain. My son bought a brand new house in Gulfport, Mississippi. Yep. Last wind that we have a move. That wind tonight it got cold, and we're gonna cut the heat on. And right there where you on the breaker that's on the inside uh, 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 where the heating unit at, uh, we couldn't even cut it on. And where the wood, when they put that panel on there, they put it on top of the breaker. Oh. And that how that how for it been brand new. So so now, the, the panel was pushing down on the breaker? Yeah, and you couldn't cut the breaker on or off. Huh. Uh, I ain't through yet. Just hold on. <laughs> they have a lot okay. of things going on. Today, uh, I didn't go for it. So my son was trying to figure out how come it, the house wouldn't heat up uh, or what. He never could figure out. It, it was hot, and he said, I'm going to go cut the air conditioning on. When he cut the air conditioning on, guess what came on? Heat. The heat. So his air conditioner is his heat, and his heat is his air conditioner. I can fix that with a dollar twenty-eight. You can buy a sharpie and change the labels <laughs> on each side. Well, he got a one-year you know, warranty. Make them do. I bet it's a heat. Pump. I, I, I want to make a, a comment. Pump. I want to. I want to make a comment. I'm very serious. Um. I told my banker this several years ago. He was buying a brand new home. And I said, um, did you get a home inspection? And he said, well, of course not. It's brand new. It's brand new. What, what could be and, wrong? <laughs> yeah. And and I said, well, I said, think about this for a minute. Um, and I'm not taking up for this builder and I'm not beating up on this builder. All I'm saying when we build a brand new home, it's never been turned on. The stove has never been turned on. The the oven, it, nothing has ever been because it's brand new. And and guess what? Humans build these houses. We right. are all subject to a mistake. Right. So so I explained that to my banker, and he said, "You know what, Jeff." That is well worth the four hundred and fifty dollars I'm going to spend to get a home inspector just to go through and inspect the home. I recommend it on any time you are buying a new or used, get a home inspection. Right. Uh, so anyway, that's that's my two cents worth to the gentleman in in Jasper County. Below. Or, or Gulfport, um, and hopefully that sh hopefully you have a um, a credible builder, and he will come back and 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 fix these issues. And you also have you can do what's called a builder warranty inspection. We do a ton of these, and the because the home supposedly is under warranty for a year, we will go in at the eleven month and you know list things right. for them. Right. Sure. All right, Sydney. What 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 other question do you have? Uh, is that ain't a record for me getting our money back for paying for the boat to inspect the house and and uh uh uh, uh, uh and and uh, it ain't did right? Oh, are you saying that it was inspected and yeah? And, oh, they charge them for it. Oh, okay. So you got an inspection and they yeah. didn't they didn't find this thing is what you're saying? Uh. -uh. There you go. Um, yeah, you can go back to the, I would go back to the inspector and say this is, and be sure though, do this for me, please read the report. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I have told people things and then they accuse me of something. I'm like, well, it's in your report on page six. Right. <laughs> you That's know, good. so you, you just, if they're reasonable, you can go back and talk to them about it and see if they won't and, help you out. So. And, and, and too, Pam, let's, let's discuss this for a minute. Uh, let's say the inspector went out. The inspector wrote it in the report. The inspector gave it to the, to the homeowner. Homeowner gives it to the builder. And then nothing is ever done. Well, that's, that's not the inspector's fault. No. So, um, you know, the inspector's job 
And look, there are several different um, classes of inspectors. I want an inspector to come in and inspect. I do not want an inspector to come in and give me their opinion. Um, I want an inspection. Inspector come in, inspects, gives the report. It's up to the homeowner at that point to execute that report. Correct. And then follow up on that report. Was that was that deficiency a true deficiency? And if it was, was it rectified? So so our folks, Sydney, are saying definitely call that inspector back and uh, see what can be done at this point because it was it was a swing and a miss. Yeah. And you can also uh, you know, we've we've got a governing, it used to be a board, now it's just a person. But if that inspector is not pleasant or good to deal with, you can file a complaint with the Mississippi Real Estate Commission. Well, and but, but you know, I would, I would go to the source. I'd go to the builder and say, look, this is not right. Yeah. Right. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, you, you, you want the deficiencies taken care of. Well, and you got to remember, too, um, on new construction, and we run into this all the time, we can get to a house and they tell us it's finished and it ain't finished. That's well, right. we're going to inspect it the way that it is. So if that inspector was inspecting and that air conditioning and heating system wasn't commissioned whenever they were there, uh. then they would just write it wasn't commissioned. I couldn't test it whenever because you and especially during the winter months it's so weird in the winter months because you cannot charge an air conditioning system in the winter you just can't there's not enough pressure in the air right. to put the refrigerant in so you're not going to be able to tell them much at that point um, so you've got to look at what the limitations are because we're inspecting the condition of the property the day we get there right. i don't have a crystal ball I can't tell you what it's going to be like next week. Right. <laughs> I can tell you what it's like today. All right, Sydney, does that help out? Yeah, Pam telling me like it is. So you, I think she's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's no mistake to die. Hey, Sydney, good luck with that, man. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you. Y'all have a nice day. You too, Sydney. Appreciate it. It's time for another break. When we uh, return, we're going to give you some reason why you should be uh, installing some smart home technology. You can join us with your questions, comments. Just tell us what project you're working on at 877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. Or send an email to fixit101 at mpbonline.org. We'll be right back. Hi, Larry Morrissey with the Arts Commission, reminding you to tune in for the Arts Hour. We have in-depth conversations with Mississippi artists, writers, musicians, and other creatives. The Mississippi Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 on MPB Radio or download it as a podcast. You're listening to Fix It 101 on MPB Think Radio, the home improvement show to help you do it yourself. I'm Jason Klein here with uh, Pam Pivas, ASHE certified inspector at Inspect It Like a Girl, and licensed contractor Jeff Sammons from Houseworks. And if you missed any of today's program, you can always listen back by podcast using any podcast app or our MPB public media app. And uh, before we uh, before we went to break, we were talking about we're going to talk some smart home technology. The biggest reason uh, for getting smart home technology, uh, 69% say it's to improve the ease or accessibility in the home. And, uh, Jeff, I think a lot of the smart home technology is playing into um, – a certain portion of building that, that that you're trained in, which is aging in place. Right, right, exactly. And now I know in this area we are doing um, Cat 5, Cat 6. We're doing, um, of course, K- we're still doing cable for some reason. Right. And I guess we're carrying <laughs> Cat 3, Cat 5, and Cat 6, I guess. Um, but then we're also doing fiber. Um, and, uh, we're doing everything we can our, on our end. So that home will grow with, um, technology, including, and I'm glad you brought up aging in place. We are putting blocking in the walls. So 
if and when you need a grab bar or you know items like that the blocking is already there oh oh i didn't even think about that that's fantastic because yeah, if and, if you've ever and, gone and, to a place and, and tried to free. install yeah. one of those big bars you've got to remember you know those bars are the, the whole point of that bar is to hold your entire weight which means it's got to grab a hold of something and the plastic thing that that uh that is uh attached to your shower is not going to be good enough it's going to have to go to something a little meat to it so anyway uh oh just got an email here we go this is my wife uh and i just purchased a town home in nashville it has hardwood floors there are a few dark spots on the wood where the previous owner's pet had apparently soiled the ground is there a possible fix for this possibly refinishing the floors that's from uh, Britain and Hattiesburg. Uh, to say this, as the layperson, I'm not the pro, but I did buy a house uh, made in the 60s that had uh, animal stains. In the I pulled this carpet up. These people had smoked for 30 years on the same carpet. It was hideous. But anyway, I pulled it up, and of course, there's gorgeous hardwood floors underneath, right? So uh, I have someone come and work on those hardwood floors, but we get to a spot in the hall where an animal previously loved this very particular spot, and it left a stain on the hardwood. And we must have sanded half an inch down, and that stain was still in the hardwood. (laughs) So getting that stain out is very difficult, depending on how much went in and how long ago. Uh, But uh, pros, have you guys seen a way to get rid of uh, pet stains in hardwood? Well... Yes, uh, if, if it is true uh, hardwood and not a laminate, if it uh-huh. is a true hardwood, uh, we can sand down a little bit. Right. Um, and, and now, let's just assume that it is soaked in there for so long. Just simply replace those boards. It's, it's still simple. Uh, you're going to end up sanding everything anyway. So pull those boards up and, and place some new some new boards there. Um, that's fantastic. Again, since all, you're gonna, all, since you're gonna re, all it uh, is is wood. Yeah. Right, it's wood, and since you're gonna re uh, color it or whatever uh, after, I guess it, it will. The color will match anyway. That's right. So, yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, we uh, we we did it in the hallway. Uh, I had a pro come and do the sanding, and we were there was three of us standing around watching this one guy with a sander. Just grind on this one spot and nothing going, nothing, nothing given. Yep. This this cat from 1984 just had his groove on that <laughs> place. So, anyway, um, I guess that's to to your own uh, inspection. Uh, number of calls eight seven seven MPB ring. That's eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Okay, uh, another email. I have a bathroom mirror that is apparently glued to the wall. I'd like to remove it. I want to cut the damaged area of the bottom and remount it. Apparently, the guy's got some water damage. But I'm not sure what I'm dealing with. Is there a standard method that construction crews use to attach mirrors to walls? I intend to remount it with an inch of clearance above the counter surrounding backsplash. Is there a reason that the mirror rests directly on the counter surround backsplash? which is why the water damage exists in the first place. If I can successfully remove the mirror intact, what adhesive should I use to remount it? Any suggestions on how to remove the mirror? I've used dental floss to remove the metal plates from trophies by sawing through the adhesive. Can I do the similar with a mirror? Janice in Walls, Mississippi. So I've heard, Jeff, you say people use like a a type of piano wire to cut through uh, yes. glue behind uh, mirrors yep that's right and that's exactly how we get them down uh now be extremely careful we had to make sure if you're going to try this you have protective eyewear long sleeve shirt gloves it, it, even the best people doing this remember it is glass it will break really? so Yes. Um, so, get it get it off. Now, I would build a wood frame, set my mirror inside the wood frame. It gets it up off your backsplash, and um, 
there's several adhesives out there that will glue a glass to sheetrock or wood, whatever uh, substrate you're putting that mirror on. Right. Well, to speak to what you uh, mentioned first was that uh, a mirror in a frame. That's what I did at my home. I got I got two frames, put mirrors in the frames, and then mounted the frames rather than gluing the mirror to the wall. Well, yes, you can do that. In new construction, what we will do, mm-hmm. we normally will take a one-by-four, we'll mount that on the wall, let the painter come in and paint, and then we'll let our, our mirror and glass company come in and set their mirror inside that frame. Oh, okay. All right. And, oh, well, that works too, Jeff. That'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, what, just be so careful. I tell you what, yeah, they need to let us know if they get that thing off successfully because no. I've just it, so it, dangerous. What it would is. you use it, to rehang it? What would you? What, what kind of adhesive might you use to put a mirror back up on a wall? Oh, oh man. now I have used power grab to do stuff onto walls or construction adhesive, all this other stuff, but all of them need a little time to set. So that's right. If you're and if if it's got any weight to it, and you put it on the wall, you've got to have some, something underneath it to to hold to and, hold it. Right. Yeah. One of the questions in the emails was about why was this mirror down on the uh, the surface? It's probably holding the weight was what the issue was. So well, yeah, when they installed, they they. But I mean, that's a I've seen that a lot. Yeah, in oh, older yeah. houses. It's, it does that. It gives it something. It gives the mirror something to rest on, and then it's just ugly to have a space between your backsplash and your mirror. So instead of us setting our mirror directly on the granite backsplash, we obviously do the one by four uh, frame or some some wood frame. Right. Set it set it on the backsplash, and then. You know, insert your mirror uh, in the center, in the inside the the wood frame. Yeah, you can do that too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, before we get out of here, Jeff. Yes. Have you seen in in especially in new construction, and they're framing out like outdoor kitchens have a vent hood, and they're yes. framing out that vent hood with barn wood. Yes. 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 Well, is barn wood fire rated? Um, you you can you can frame it out in in barn wood. You can frame it out in cedar. Uh, it is not you, you're not violating code there. Yeah, but now, doesn't that? I now, mean, if you have a if you're cooking something with a lot of grease on it, and you get a flame out. Is that not going to catch on fire? Well, it is again. Absolutely, anything can catch on fire if you put a flame under it. And but but it is not code. To have that material wrapping that vent system in a non-combustible material. I know, and, and see, and but doesn't it make sense? I mean, that just seems to me like Pam just wants to I argue with you, Jeff. Well, well I, was, I mean, because I see this a lot, and I'm like, and I tell the client, I said, you know, there's nothing that says you can't do it, but you better not have a cooking fire because you've just set your whole kitchen on fire. If that. Because barn wood, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but that, Poof. that stuff burns. Right. It's just like that paneling that you were talking about. So I just, I understand because it looks awesome. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, it looks so good to come in these kitchens and have, you know, this barn wood above the range of, of this industrial gas range <laughs> with right. barn wood hanging above it. Right. <laughs> And let's just think about that for a minute. And there's nothing in the code book that says you can't do it. That's a very good point, though. It is a very good point. <laughs> Barn wood has been dried for 100 years. So yeah, all it takes is a very small uh, spark to go up quickly. Well, and I, you know, I'll tell the client, I'm like, your builder's not going to change that probably. And you're probably not going to change it. But as your home inspector, I'm going to tell you that that could be a safety problem. Hmm. Jeff will come with a moral of the story at some point. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to comment to that. Yes, yes, anything can catch on fire. Now, 
let's say that that we put a stainless steel uh, wrap around. We, we've got to use some sort of substrate. Um, I, I don't know. I'm I'm not going to comment on it. Okay, let's leave that uh, where it lies. Fix it. One on one. That was the proper use of words. Fix It 101 is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting, Think Radio, and is funded by the generous contributions from listeners like you. Our show is produced by Mr. Java Chapman. Our call screener today was Liz Gill. For Pam Pibas, Jeff Sammons, and I'm Jason Klein. Up next is special live coverage from NPR of the inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Make sure you uh, join us next Wednesday at 9 for more Fix It 101 right here on MPB Think Radio.